working seven days a week and 24 hours. Yep. London Pogmire, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Thank you so much for having me. Well, the youngest ever guest by, mm. I think, a very long shot. I'm trying to think of the youngest person I've had. I'm sure they're in their mid-20s. <laughs> 13 years of age, is that correct? Yep. Coming out of Idaho, the United States of America somewhere? Mm-hmm. It's an absolute thrill to have you on the show today, London. And uh, for context, we'll get into some of your story in a minute, but for context, uh, the reason that you and I know each other is we uh, bumped into each other at a fu- funnel hacking live event in Orlando early this year where your mum and your mum and your own amazing mum and dad were managing a, um, a merchandise, huge merchandise stand there and, and uh, something energetically brought us together. And maybe it was because I was wearing my my crazy cowboy hat at the time, and one of the one of the guys you were talking to was uh, a fan of cowboys in Australian accents. Who knows? Who knows? But the, the reason that I was so excited to have you on this podcast today, the premise of the show is to bring on people that have a message that will empower, inspire, and motivate people to take action for themselves. To, to become their own superhero. And so often in our lives, we idolize other superheroes like Spider-Man and, and Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman and Batwoman and, you know, <laughs> all the litany of other Marvel characters that exist out there. But you, you London, to me, are the epitome of someone who is becoming their own superhero. And to have your message out into the world, I think, is a matter of uh, national importance. So I wanted to thank you for coming on today and sharing whatever you want to share that's important to you. Thank you so much. So my first question is, what happened to you and why do you want to talk about it? Well, it was, um, so I was in fifth grade a year ago. I was sexually assaulted by a close family member he was practically family because he, he was like my best friend. And he was about my sister's age, about 16. And it was really hard at first, you know, because I like I had a lot of trust for him and he had broken my trust. And so after it, it was really hard to trust people. And like even my own dad was hard to trust. And like because I know like I trusted him for so long and I never thought something was going to happen, but then it did. So I didn't know if I could trust other people. So I had a lot of like problems with like giving people my trust and like be able to like fully open up to them. And um, it was really hard for me to like talk about to other people. And my friends would tell me about how like they had similar problems and like how they haven't told anybody and they even felt afraid to tell their parents. And that just crushed me. And I was like, like even like, I just want to help them. And I want to be able to share my story to help empower them to feel like they can come out and talk about it. And we we love you so much for for being brave enough to share this, right? And and it, you know, I think Anna said, my wife, when she interviewed you, it's still relatively fresh, right? Like, uh, you know, you were were only 11 years old at the time and, and he was 16, as you mentioned. So there was like, there's a, there's a whole list of, of challenges in there. The, the experience itself, you you went and spoke to an adult straight away. Do you mind sharing yeah. what happened? Yes. Yeah, so we were on the bus and like right after it happened, my sister had saw through the crack of the bus and she like warned my mom. She's like, something's just not right. And so my mom called me up, you know, and I was just like, she could tell something was wrong. So she pulled me up in the seat above and she like, I just like started crying and I just like told her what happened and everything. And like, she was so great. Like I was so scared what she was going to think, you know, cause like, I didn't even know, like, I don't even know what had happened is wrong. Cause I'd never been experienced to something or like, like had anything happen like that before. And so it was really new and fresh and it was really hard, but she was like, we're going to do everything we can to protect you. Like, this is not your fault. Like this is on him. Cause like, I felt some of that guilt and like, I still do sometimes for like not saying anything. And like speaking up like when it was happening but they were she was awesome about it and my sisters 
they were so supportive and they helped me through the whole trip because we were in Mexico at the time and they helped protect me and keep me away from him the whole trip. The For, for context and only share whatever you, you're happy to share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was, you were on a bus. There's a the whole bunch of families together. It was on a bus and, mm-hmm. and it was under the, the guise of he thinking that you were asleep. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. And and your sister saw through this the gap in the seats and the bus, something wasn't right, and she went and lured your mum, and then that's and you and then you although you were awake the whole time, you you sort of pretended like you'd just woken up and that sort of startled and, yes. and then prevented further assault. Okay. Is that mm-hmm. right? Yes. So and I'm and I want to be trying to be as delicate around this subject as I can because I mm-hmm. um I don't want to ever re-traumatize. <laughs> All right, and but I, I never would have brought you on here if I thought that that was you know a, a real thing. The context of it, I think, is really significant because the question that I that I would love to ask is, given the the benefit of hindsight, you know what I mean by that word, like the, of, of retrospect, of like looking back, mm-hmm. is there any alternate outcome that you could have hoped would have happened from the moment that that mum was alerted to what had happened? So when it, like, a few weeks after and, like, a couple months after it happened, I was like, oh, I would give anything to go back. You know, like, I would go back in a heartbeat and, like, change what I'd done, you know, or, like, reacted faster and known what to do. But, like, looking back now and, like, the things I've learned from it, like, I wouldn't have been who I am right now without it. And I wouldn't be able to help people. And, like, I want to be the person I've grown into be right now and I want to have the maturity that I have right now and so I'm honestly like grateful in a way that happened because this made me who I am Uh, which is such a grown-up wonderful mature (laughs) response that most adults can't come to grips with um I, I, I see where you're coming from with regards to that response and and I'm I'm also talking around like if you were talking to Another another young eleven year old woman, girl, right? Who's who's sitting in that situation on a bus, and the the assault has just happened. Is there any other outcome that you could say, "Hey, here's what I would do in that situation now," with the benefit of looking back? I mean, it's hard to say to someone who's happened so fresh because personally, from like what if I was like that person, I would want to be like attacking the person you know and like speaking up and like at least like saying something like because what I did was I just like woke up and like I kind of wish I would have been like hey you know like stop so I probably would have given like hey maybe like next time when it happens if you get involved around something like that or if like since you still have trauma from that and a guy comes like preferably your boyfriend and he could try to do something like that and you're still not comfortable with it maybe you can like speak up next time but I wouldn't put any shame on them And like, really like say next time do this or like you did this wrong, you should do this. So I would never do that. But I'd be like for further notice, then next time it happens, you could do this for your comfortability. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly right. And and I think the um, so I'm clear, this would be like if you were to write a guide, a guidebook of like (laughs) how to how to manage all of these and navigate these circumstances (laughs) to someone that's never gone through any of this stuff. You would never ever want to shame someone for yeah. anything because, well, it, that doesn't serve anyone, and it certainly doesn't make the situation any better, right? Yeah. So, you've gone through this this experience. There's a rippling effect across the community and family, and, and all kinds of stuff that happens. And and at the time, it seems like the the world is crashing in, and and. Did you have moments where you sort of reached out to God and you were like, you know, why, why did this happen? Why did you allow this to happen? Mm -hmm. I felt that very deeply for a very long time. And it like, I feel like that was like the hardest part getting over was like the guilt and like, why me? Like, why did that happen to me? Like, I would always like, before I go to bed, I always pray. So I would just like, I would cry and I just prayed to him like, why me? Like, why do I have to go through this? Like, what did I deserve to go through this? But like now that I think about it, like this was meant to happen so I can help other people. Like running into you, like 
there were over 5,000 people at that conference. The like the ability that we were able to like catch eye contact and come and see each other was like crazy. Like if you put like me and a thousand or 5,000 people in a room, the possibilities of F even like meeting is insane. So the, like, it's just like, it was bound to happen. Like, that's crazy. And I want to be here on your podcast if that hadn't happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's look, it's, it's very, it's very unlikely that you would be on here for that particular reason, but you never know, but I hear what you're saying. And for context, the, the reason why, uh, I, I don't really know how to explain it, but like the energy of that event was lots of brilliant people from all around the world and instinctively with, with the permission of the group, which you were a part of, um, after talking for a few minutes, I shared some of what had happened to my wife, Anna, who's got a podcast, um, world's best, uh, trauma recovery podcast, uh, and shared her childhood sexual abuse. And then basically, you know, without even thinking or hesitating, you shared that something happened to you as well. W mm -hmm. Was that the first time that you'd ever publicly shared it in that environment? Well, it was, I've like, I shared it with like close family members, but like, I never knew you. And so it was kind of like new to like, just open up and say it, but it felt right. Well, it was, it was a real, I want to say a real privilege to, to have someone open up in that fashion, particularly, you know, someone at, at, at 13, like I think about my, my own life when I was 13, my life was in turmoil and I was, <laughs> I was, uh, running away from my mother and, and, and going, I went to go live with my father at 13 or 14 as well. Like I had lots going. I didn't have the measuredness, uh, <laughs> and the, the, the grown upness that you had the maturity, and um, I was like, who is this girl? And I, <laughs> and, uh, and then we're able to facilitate a connection between you and my, my amazing wife, Anna, and that sort of snowballed from there. Uh, there's so many questions that I have. The, the, <laughs> one of the main ones is around, what do you think you want to do with this gift that you've got now? Oh, there are so many things that I want to do. Like I have like a list of things that like I could use with this and like I want to go forward and like using this for something like as a career for when I'm older because I just want to be able to help people, you know, like that's like my favorite thing, you know, and helping people through this is like 10 times better. So um, I have a school counselor at my school and she has helped me so much. I brought her up in Anna's podcast too, but she's the best. And I want to be able, when I'm older, I want to be a school counselor like she is so I can help another little kids like me or a boy who's young me and help them through anything that they need. Because I just love helping people. And so that's probably what I would do. Which is, uh, which is great. And, and you were helping people long before this happened, right? How are you helping people? Um, so me and my mom, right, like be, um, before this happened, I like I loved horses, you know, and I wanted to like go out and like help people all the time. And we we had just started looking at horses and stuff. And we found these people who had horses and we could like gain this connection with them. And now my mom, she does horse therapy, equine therapy every weekend. And she helps like um veterans from the like and retired military and retired police officers who have PTSD and I would go out there and help her and they range from like ages from like eight to like as old as you are and um they help people and they do help with breathing and I go out and help her a lot and that's what I would do I remember listening to that interview with uh, Anna and you were talking about the significance of equine therapy, like dealing with horses. They're very slow breathing animals, aren't they? Or slow mm -hmm. heart rates. Yep. And you and you kind of nuzzle up and you're like, mm -hmm. it all, all gets in sync and that's what helps calm people down. Is that right? Yeah. It's helped me a lot. What else has helped you? Um, I feel like opening up to people, like talking about it, is like one of the key factors like like if something happens to people and they don't share it then this is all bottled up 
but like talking about it and getting it out and sharing your experiences with others helps them as well to like be like oh well she did it so I can do it like it's even when you're at school and you're like say you have like a really cute outfit or something and you're like too afraid to wear it because you don't know what people are going to think of you but then you see someone else wearing it and then it gives you the courage to go wear it because you're not going to be the only person doing it so it's like the, the speaking up so once I started doing it then I can like help other people to speak up because then they'll be like oh she did it, so I can do it that's so great there's a quote from a very famous man called Les Brown who we've spoken mm-hmm. about he says what people think of me is none of my business <laughs> do you think that that has helped you in any of this healing journey a statement like that <laughs> yeah it's I have I've had problems with like what people think of me and like being good enough for people but like going through this and like real like having the realization like it's all in like your head and like you can think people are thinking things about you and like they could be spreading rumors but hurt people my mom always tells me she goes hurt people hurt people and so when someone's hurt Cause you have, they look perfect on the outside, you know? And like, you wish you would be, you looked like them and you wish you had their life, but like, you have no idea what happens behind closed doors. So my mom always tells me like, if you're having comparison problems where people are being rude to you or, or like something like that, like, what's the whole story? What don't I know? And if I knew, how would it change what I thought about them? Cause they come to school and they like show off this like whole image of themselves that could completely be not true because they have like problems at home. And so they want to come to school because that's like the only place where they can like truly be themselves. You're exactly right. And, you know, as a 13 year old, that was my first year of high school back in New Zealand. There was nothing more important than being liked by you, by your peers. It was an all boys schools, about 1200 students. And if you didn't, if you, if you were shunned by the rest of everyone, and thankfully that never happened to me, uh, cause I was a chameleon. I was a chameleon. Like I was, I could get on with the jocks and the, and the nerds and the, um, you know, well, they, they were, it sounds racist, but they were like the Asians, like they were, you know, cause it was so, it was just this, how it was back then. Right. And I got on, I got on well with, with all of those, those, um, demographics, but I can imagine the, the, the challenge around trying to take on a quote like what people think of me is none of my business. Like it's a lot easier once you've lived a bit of life, I think. But yeah. as, a, as a 13-year-old, like for, for your schoolmates that are listening to this, and, and I know that they will listen to this, what advice do you have of what you know, right? It doesn't have to be right. What, what mm-hmm. advice would you give for people that are that have had something horrendous happen to them but are so fearful of sharing it with the world for whatever reason, what advice would you give them? I mean, personally, I would say love yourself and do it for yourself before you do it for other people. Cause like now, like my motto is like, find that little girl and find your why and do it for her. But like, if it's still fresh and like, they still are afraid to like come out and talk about it. I would say like, accept themselves and forgive themselves first and be able to like fully love yourself. And then it's like the little steps to like come out about it and talk about it. It's a wonderful advice, London. What, what, what are some steps? Like, how do you know that you are able to love yourself? How do you know you're in that right zone? Well, I feel like it's different for everybody. And I feel like being able to forgive yourself is one way I was able to love myself and not being able to blame myself, you know, and like being happy with myself and like the way I look and not like being jealous of other people or like worried about what other people think of me, but like being able to like stand tall, you know, and like walk through the halls with my head held high and like not afraid of what people think of me, you know. Now you've had a few, um, friends that have that have listened to the other interview you did with Anna and you you know you're being booked on uh what, what will be a number of podcasts over the next mm-hmm. you know for the rest of your life I suppose what's been some of the feedback that you've received from people that you that you like and trust 
I'm so grateful for like everybody I have because they have just given me so much like love and comfort. Like I'm so grateful for everybody, but like all my friends, it's more so girls because they also just like understand more. But they've been so loving. They're like, oh, my, me and my friend, we both sat down in my room and listened to your podcast and just cried the whole time. Like, you're going to help so many people. Like, I can't wait to see where you go with this. And like my other friends, like, I'm so proud of you. Like, you've come so far. And like all of this. Yeah, I'm getting lumps in my throat. <laughs> I think I did the same thing as well. Um, and this is the ultimate compliment, right? It's like the ultimate impact that you that you don't realize you can have when you have the courage and you know for people that haven't don't know anything about me for context like my journey is not anything like yours but I conquered drinking drugs and gambling and philandering and limiting beliefs and health issues and all this other stuff and and in the process uh, over a number of years lost the majority of my circle of friends right and I use inverted commas inverted, inverted commas for those who are listening because they were not, not that they're bad people. We just, mm-hmm. we were different. Like they were, they were drinking buddies and there was no substance into that friendship. And I think it's, and it's challenging when you make a stand, right? Like with what you've done and saying, I'm not going to be held bound to this. I'm not going to be a victim to this. I'm going to live my life and live with my head high and my shoulders back like you're doing. And thankfully, for the for the most part, it seems that the response has been overwhelmingly positive, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, how could it not be? But for those that are listening, if you ever experience any negative response from people when you share, right? So it's, it is important to share with people that you trust, all right, that will listen ideally without judgment, all right? That's a really important one. That if someone is attacking you for you talking about any of this kind of stuff you're with it with it with whatever you've gone through i've gone through it is because they are manifesting their own insecurities all right it is a direct reflection of themselves and you know i think that that's one of the things that i wish that i knew about going into my journey because when i was growing up london i was a people pleaser you know what i mean mm-hmm. by that Yep. And I, all I would try to do everything to get everyone to like me, and it's a lo- it's a lost game because you just can't mm-hmm. please everyone. If you pl- try and please everyone, you'll please no one, right? Yep. If you stand for nothing, you fall for everything, as they say. So as you grow and develop into this, this blossom into this amazing butterfly of, of a, like enlightenment, I don't know how else to describe it, but it's so <laughs> exciting watching on this journey and like, You've even started writing a book, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. I was like, because my favorite thing is writing, you know? And like I juggled between like writing and like what else I want to do, but I want to do something like crazy fun and like travel the world, but write, you know? And then I met Anna and she was like, what do you want to be my, write a book with me? And I was like, yes. Like I was like, this is like the best thing that could ever happen to me. And I was so excited, you know, and like I got down and I was like starting to type, you know, and like, I, I didn't really realize how hard it was, you know, cause I hadn't talked about it in a long time. And so it was bringing up a lot of like fresh and like new stuff. And it was hard, like being able to like say that to like the whole world, you know. Has that, has that process of writing gotten easier? For sure it has. And like with the help of just like what you guys told me when I was on Anna's podcast, when you guys were talking to me after uh, you guys said just like 200 words a day or like just like a paragraph or more in a day. And that's really helped me. And like, it doesn't even have to be in order, you know, just like whatever comes to your head, just like put it down. Yeah. And the fact that you're so receptive to this advice is so great by the way, (laughs) because you know, maybe it wasn't made apparent, but I, the reason that I would love to read what you would have written is nothing to do with necessarily getting a book out into the world for other people. Mm -hmm. That's a part of it, but it's the healing that happens when you really submit to the universe and put it down on paper and write it in a way that no one's ever going to see it. 
And mm-hmm. and as it's on paper longer and it's out, you become more and more accustomed to it. If you can imagine Anna keeping her secret for 20 plus years, when she first shared it, it was like the dam bursting. And now she can mm-hmm. share it in front of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people on a show, you know, like, and so it does get easier. And and I suppose a question I have for you, London, is what what are some of the other benefits in your life anywhere that you've noticed since this whole experience? I have noticed like a lot of more love from other people. Not that I didn't have it in the beginning, but like they can just like understand and give me more sympathy because they know what I've gone through. And I feel like I've been accepted more because of the maturity that have has come because of it. So I've had a lot more opportunities and things I wouldn't have been able to do if it weren't for it because I want to have like the same maturity level that I have now. I don't know where this question's come from, but it's just something I want to ask. Has it allowed you to step into your inner child more does that make any sense to you that question let me let let me re-ask so so we all have an inner child Mm -hmm. in us and mine apparently loves ice cream and milkshakes (laughs) and it's like my two-year-old inner child and it's where all my like a lot of my creativity and my crazy ideas come from and when I grew up as a child of divorce, London, I I was forced to grow up a lot faster than than what a normal kid in that environment and, and a normal environment would have had to do, right? And it's not a big deal. I'm grateful for everything I went through, but I neglected my inner child in that in those years, and so it kind of manifested itself as I as a full blown adult. And I just wonder if at any point. After this experience, have you noticed any more connectedness to this inner child where you don't take yourself so seriously or I don't know? Yeah. So like after it happened, I like realized like how much I took for granted when I was younger, you know, and like how easy it was and like how like the only problems I had was like my sister just stole my toy or something, you know? (laughs) So like I like, I was like, I would mourn for it to come back, you know? And so like me and my friends, we would like promise each other, like we would like make every day the best day ever. That's our new motto. And so like whenever Can I you see say that friends, one more time, can you say that one more time? Whenever I see my friends, we're like, make the today the best day ever. So every day is the best day ever. Fantastic. So better. So whenever I see my friend in the hall, I'm like, today's the best day ever. And <laughs> so like me and my friends goof around all the time. It's given me like, maturity that I needed, but also like the child that I took for granted. Is that word we're looking for maybe empathy? It's given you more empathy for yourself and for other people. Mm -hmm. That's maybe where I'm trying to go with. Sorry for, uh, you know, you can tell I don't plan a lot of these questions. (laughs) I'm flying by the seat of my pants with this stuff, but I'm, I'm just, I'm so interested because I've met a lot of people in my life, London, I've met a lot of people and a lot of really brilliant, amazing people. I've been very fortunate. And then I've met you and I've never met anyone like you. I've never met a, a, someone of your age with your levels of maturity and your levels of balls, they call it, right? World's best <laughs> courage coach. And, yet, you know, you're the most courageous person I know. You're the most courageous teenager I know, certainly. And and it is so inspiring. And, I, you know, I've had moments in the time that I got to meet you guys and I've thought about you and your story, and it's helped me overcome some little frivolous thing that I had going on in my life. And it is so inspiring. And I'm so, so blessed and fortunate to have stumbled across you and then had an opportunity to bring you on to get your message out into the world. So for people that are listening to this that have a podcast that that you feel like you could benefit from having London on, then you need to connect and uh and we can make that happen. Speaking of which. How do people get a hold of you if they can? Uh, you can contact me through my email, which is London Sophia um, at iCloud.com. And that's to spell the way it sounds? Yep. With London Sophia dot with a PH. Yeah. Okay. At iCloud.com. Okay. Yep. Brilliant. 
London, do you have any concluding thoughts for our amazing audience today? I just want to thank you and Anna for everything that you've given me and the opportunities I've had because I know I want to be here for free for you guys because I want to know you. But <laughs> but I'm just so grateful for you guys and you guys have helped so many people and so many more to come. So thank you. Well, you are so welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, London Pugmire. Seven days a week and 24 hours Yup, yeah, I got the business saying this boy sure is up to something Why don't you come and listen, just don't hit the power button They say I'm crazy when I say I got the superpowers